from the headquarters of Tell Us Your English in Quito, Ecuador. This is from the South, and I am Sweeney Gray. Colombians have been protesting against what they say was fraud in the first round of the presidential election last Sunday. Hundreds of mainly young protesters marched through the capital, Bogota, to the electoral registration office. They say videos and other documents indicate irregularities and manip manipulation in the counting of the votes, which may have inflated the score for the right-wing candidate, Ivan Duque. Our Jose Manuel Jimenez has more from the protests in Bogota. We are in front of the National Registry Office where many citizens gather to ask for transparency in the June 17th, second round of the presidential elections. There were many reports of irregularities when presenting the E-14 forms, the document where votes for each candidate are registered at the end of election day. This also made the Electoral Observers Board check the three forms that must be presented at the end of the elections. Right now, the Electoral Board is double-checking to see if the reports about corrections and votes are true and if it gave Ivan Duque the big win in Bogota and other regions around the country. The foundation, called Peace and Reconciliation, warned weeks ago about a possible fraud. They are receiving new reports right now. Claudia Lopez, the Presidential Alliance of Sergio Fajardo, said that mistakes are human, but if those mistakes are benefiting only Ivan Duque, then they should be investigated. There will be a meeting between the national government and the National Electoral Council to talk about these complaints and to take actions for the coming June 17th elections. Those reports of irregularities in the first round have been surfacing for several days. In Colombia, the issue of fraud is not new. This is why experts have been paying close attention to new complaints on Sunday's first round of the presidential elections. There was a problem in 2014 where there was evidence of fraud. And in March 2018, there was also proof of fraud in the congressional elections. We have received all sorts of evidence here in the foundation and we are reviewing it all. According to the National Registrar, there is no problem in the Form E-14, the document that records the number of votes for each candidate. However, their explanation leaves some unanswered questions. Obviously, there are a lot of forms. There are almost 290,000 E-14 forms. They are being checked, and in some cases there could be a mistake. But that's very different, and it's not a fraud. The electoral observers will review the issue with a sample of more than 95,227 tables available from the election and it will assess what type of errors were caused in the E14 forms. We will take a sample of 13,183 tables that are from 882 polling stations. We will review each 14 form and compare them with the ones that the register has in its system. Experts insist that the electoral process needs to be changed. This can only be solved with an electronic voting system. While we still have manual voting, fraud could happen. According to the Electoral Observation Mission, there must be also changes to the way electoral juries are chosen. Also, Colombia has officially become NATO's first Latin American partner. President Juan Manuel Santos visited the U.S.-led military alliance's headquarters in Brussels. Santos and Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg agreed that NATO and Colombia should work together in areas of mutual interest. We have experience in conflict settlement, in the fight against organized crime, in the fight against drug trafficking, illegal migration, natural disasters, with climate change. All of our armed forces everywhere in the world must keep this on their agenda because they can help in mitigating the effects and the consequences of natural disasters brought by climate change. Colombia is uh, NATO's uh, newest uh, partner and our first uh, partner uh, from uh, Latin America. 
Our partnership is based on our shared commitment to international peace and stability. And over the past five years, our cooperation has provided real benefits both to Colombia and to NATO. And we discussed how we are working together in different fields as demining, uh, but also interoperability, how we work together when it comes to military education and training. And we would very much like to strengthen and to expand that cooperation with uh, Colombia. And during his visit to the European Parliament in Strasbourg, protesters held signs saying stop NATO interference in Latin America and the Caribbean. They also demanded an end to the murders of political leaders in Colombia. The European Union announced Thursday that it is providing more than $17 million to help Colombia's former FARC rebels reintegrate into society. The, the announcement came at a summit in the Belgian capital, Brussels, where President Ma Juan Manuel Santos was in attendance. The international organization affirmed that despite the ongoing obstacles that challenge the process, the EU will continue its participation in Colombia's quest for peace. Joining us to discuss Colombia's partnership with NATO is Jose Antonio Figueroa, a Colombian professor and researcher at the Central University of Ecuador. Professor, thank you for joining us. What is the relevance of Colombia being the first Latin American country to become a NATO partner, and what does that mean for the region? So, you need the announcement done by Juan Manuel Santos is really worrisome for all the, the region. Uh, uh, Colombia is considered in this moment as a global partner of NATO, uh, and uh, the, well, he's uh, belong to the Building Integrity Program. Uh, if we take into consideration the fact that the main purpose of NATO is the, the guarantee of freedom and security of, of its member, it means that uh, once uh, Colombia is recognized into, into the organization, uh, any, any uh, problem that Colombia has, uh, uh, NATO declared as Colombia having, is a reason uh, that could um, uh, let other countries to uh, uh, the, let all the NATO countries to support Colombia against the, uh, uh, a country that is supposed to be an, uh, attacking or, or considering a, 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 as an enemy of, of Colombia. So it's really a, a, a worrisome uh, because if we think about the, the, the condition of Colombia, Colombia is a very conflicted uh, uh, country. Colombia has a seven that seven million of the displaced people. Uh, uh, and and the, the kind of agreement with NATO in this moment is a kind of support of a uh, of the the military the the, the, the military uh, uh, road that is taken for for the extreme right in, in Colombia. So uh, uh, it, it, we, uh, as a as a region, all the countries should take uh, should think about uh, about the the, the the condition that uh, represent the incorporation of, of Colombia to NATO. Now, Professor, what does this mean for Colombia's neighbors, specifically Venezuela? Okay, if we think, for instance, uh, that being the, the relation between Colombia and Venezuela so fragile and, uh, and uh, 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 with a lot of stress in the, in the last years, it is uh, possible that uh, uh, NATO decide in a moment that uh, Venezuela, for instance, represent a danger for Colombia, uh, and is is a and is a, a, a excellent reason for for NATO to decide on direct military intervention in Venezuela. So um, I, I think it's mandatory for Latin America in this moment to start thinking about the the, the meaning for for the violation of sovereignty for for, for all the continent and and specifically for for Venezuela. This is a really, really big, big problem. Thank you so much, Professor Jose Antonio Figueroa. We've been speaking to the professor, from, who's a researcher and professor at the Central University of Ecuador. And now we're going to go to a break. So join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting.
Welcome back. A month away from the elections, electoral campaigns in Mexico continue. They are considered historic due to the high number of participants. So let's see how the four candidates are placed in the polls. The coalition candidate from Juntos Haremos Historia, Andrés Manuel López Obrador, remains the favorite to win the upcoming presidential election in Mexico. A recent study in the most important newspaper in the country confirmed it. According to polls, the left-wing candidate is 27 points ahead of conservative Ricardo Anaya, leaving José Antonio Meade with a mere 19 percent. In the case of PRI, they are interested in keeping power in some bastions, some districts and towns. I've heard it from PRI members themselves. They don't want to lose all power in some important states. This is the same with PAN. In an attempt to keep order in the polls, the General Council of the National Electoral Institute issued a set of rules that included prior registration of any opinion poll. The National Electoral Institute has to issue a set of methodological criteria that is accepted by the survey industry and that is binding for all the polls that are published during the ongoing electoral process. López Obrador's popularity has held fast since beginning of the electoral process in 2017, despite counter campaigns by some powerful businessmen, such as Germán Larrea, the CEO of Grupo México, Mexico's largest mining corporation. Larrea sent letters to his employees suggesting they vote for the ruling party. I understand their concerns because Germán Larrea has been one of the most important businessmen during the current neoliberal period a good businessman, and also a good influence peddler. Meanwhile, support for López Obrador's campaign floods social networks. On July 1st, 89.1 million Mexicans are eligible to vote. Besides choosing a new president, they will choose 128 senators, 500 lower house representatives, and renew nine state governments, including the government of the capital city. The Nicaraguan government has released a statement condemning the acts of violence that have occurred since April 18th, particularly those which took place on Wednesday as Nicaraguan families observe Mother's Day. The government confirmed that there are no paramilitary forces or groups affiliated with the government. And they say that this violent situation has been created by opposition groups with specific political agendas which have taken a criminal form, causing terror. The government is calling for calm, an end to violence, and for coordinated efforts to engage in national dialogue. Earlier, the Nicaraguan army gave a press conference to provide an update following a series of violent demonstrations carried out on May 30th. During the evening hours of May 30th, 2018, 11 people were admitted who were taken to the military hospital's emergency room. Among them, two civilians who were already deceased, and eight others who were hospitalized as the result of injuries sustained by firearms. Another was admitted due to a fall. Six police officers were among those admitted to the hospital. Police attacks on students have been on the rise in Chile. In just one week, three schools have been violently evicted by the police, leaving children with serious injuries. A student was left unconscious after brutal police repression last Monday in the Confederacion Suiza school. Parent groups went to visit him at the hospital and they also announced they will take legal action against those responsible. We reject with great conviction the extreme violence that the government of Sebastián Piñera is using against student protesters. They are exercising irrational repression, repression that also drifts towards torture, which puts the lives of the students at risk. Student Carlos Valdovinos arrived unconscious to the hospital with signs of strangulation. This diagnosis was confirmed by the student when he woke up. He says the policemen started fighting him, and since they couldn't subdue him, they started to choke him with a piece of cloth, he told. Then he couldn't breathe, but they didn't care, so he lost consciousness. Witnesses say that once he was unconscious, they threw him into a police car and brought him here. The feminist wave that took over the country also took over some of the most renowned schools that on this day and age are still divided by gender. This is why students are protesting for non-sexist education. But the police in Chile are suppressing protests as if this were a war. 
What is most outrageous for the parents of these students is that what happened with the students who almost lost his life happened merely days after the brutal repression against the National Institute. I started taking pictures and trying to separate policemen from students when a tear gas canister hit my head. In that moment, I didn't realize that I had a cut. But after some time, blood started coming down. The scar is still there. This violence shook authorities into investigating the events and carrying out the required protocols. When we enter a school, the police need to have the equipment necessary to protect themselves and students. There is no protocol that says they should throw chairs. That's beyond any police protocol or code of conduct. It's apparent only policemen have yet to know this fact because no changes have been made after the emergency meeting following the acts of violence. And in Bolivia, authorities have arrested a police officer who they say is behind the killing of a student protester, Jonathan Kispe. Our correspondent in La Paz, Freddy Morales, has the details. The government has announced more details about the death of Jonathan Kispe, a university student of El Alto, which occurred on May 24th. The police officer, Sub-Lieutenant Christian Casanova, was presented to the press as the main shooter. He is currently in detention. According to a report by government official Carlos Romero, the Sub-Lieutenant used a shotgun to fire a child's marble at the student. Romero issued an apology for claiming that the marble bullet was shot by university students who have started protesting in the streets to exercise their rights. We thank Freddy Morales for that report. Argentina's President Mauricio Macri has vetoed a new bill approved by the Senate to control the rising cost of essential utilities. The law aimed to bring prices of water, electricity and gas back to the levels they had been in November 2017. Now, the measures will only allow tariff increases in line with user salaries or pensions. The move was proposed by the opposition. In Barbados, 10 of the 12 new government senators have been sworn in. Meanwhile, the opposition Democratic Labour Party, which was swept out of Parliament in the election, was scheduled to meet on Thursday to decide whether they will take up the offer by Prime Minister Mia Motley to appoint two opposition senators. Motley announced on Saturday she had to amend the constitution to make the offer since the opposition leader appoints senators and there's none in this parliament. The Caribbean Development Bank says the region needs to invest in developing the blue economy, meaning monetizing its marine resources. The body says the blue economy can address GDP shortfalls. However, the CDB report says the region needs to combine climate change mainstreaming and innovative funding because marine resources are notoriously fragile. And with hurricane season due to officially begin on June 1st, Grenada's Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Mitchell, is challenging the Caribbean to learn the lessons from the 2017 hurricane season. The Prime Minister says, Regional governments need to include climate change resilience in development planning. For that, Mitchell has created a new government ministry of climate change, environment, fisheries, forestry, and disaster management for Grenada. In practice, we'll require shifting focus from sustainable development to climate smart development. At the macro level, we must accelerate our transition to greet the green and blue economies. And in so doing, synchronize economic development with environmental sustainability. Operationally, we must institutionalize climate risk screening of all infrastructure projects and programs of both the public and private sectors. Venezuela has sent 12 tons of supplies to Cuba as humanitarian aid after the state of emergency due to heavy rains. The Minister, Minister of the Interior, Nestor Reverol, said that the Venezuelan government is supporting the Cuban people who have suffered serious damage with the passage of subtropical storm Alberto affecting five provinces. The storm has flooded the central area of the island, causing four deaths and serious damage to homes. Causando graves afectaciones a los cultivos, 
Cuba has been affected by the subtropical storm Alberto, causing serious damage to crops, houses, roads, bridges, and power plants. Thousands of people have been evacuated across five provinces. The Venezuelan government wants to ratify its commitment by sending this humanitarian aid. We want to provide moral and social support and also express our solidarity to the Cuban people. And President Diaz-Canel is back in Cuba after his trip to Venezuela on Wednesday. Cuban TV showed his predecessor, Raul Castro, meeting him at the airport. During his trip, Diaz-Canel and the Venezuelan President, Nicolas Maduro, fortified the bond between the two countries. More than two months have passed since the kidnapping and murder of the Ecuadorian journalist on the Colombian border. Now the Ecuadorian authorities are handing over some of their personal belongings to their relatives. Christian, who is the son of the driver Efren Segarra, recovered his father's car. The car, which transported the journalist team to Matahe, was found in the town by the Ecuadorian military forces. The relatives drove around the city in honor of their loved ones. It is a tribute to all of the drivers who accompany working journalists in their work, to the photographers and the journalists. It is a tribute and it is with gratitude to all those that have supported us in this unfortunate event. Ecuadorian cyclist Richard Carapaz was received by hundreds of people in Quito following his historic performance in the Tour of Italy bike race. Carapaz won the attention of the international and local media after winning the eighth stage of the Tour of Italy, becoming the first Ecuadorian to place first in a stage in one of the three biggest cycling races in the world. He finished fourth in the overall standings, competing for the Spanish Movistar team. We're going to take another short break, but join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. Welcome back. Spanish Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy will not resign ahead of a vote of confidence in his leadership to be held on Friday. This is according to the Secretary General of Rajoy's People's Party, Maria Dolores de Cospedal. The right-wing politicians always in office appeared numbered after a Basque political party said it would back the no-confidence vote called over a corruption case. The current Spanish leader can be seen here being bundled out of a restaurant where he had been meeting with some of his cabinet following the no-confidence debate in the parliament, which he left while still in session. 
Pedro Sanchez is almost certain to become Spain's new prime minister after his socialist party secured enough votes to topple Mariano Rajoy in the confidence vote over a corruption case. Protests are taking place in the United States, demanding justice for the murder of Claudia Patricia Gomez Gonzalez, a 20-year-old Guatemalan woman murdered in the U.S.-Mexico border. Meanwhile, her body was sent back to Guatemala today, where it was received by her family. Alina Duarte has all the details. The murder was committed by Border Patrol agent. This is the reason why one of the protests in Washington took place outside the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Also yesterday, people gathered in Manhattan, New York, to demand justice for this murder and also to end the xenophobic policies of the Trump administration. Claudia Patricia was the oldest of three and had just graduated as an accountant in 2016. She was traveling from Guatemala to the state of Virginia, where a vigil was held demanding justice for this crime. Leaders of several countries have come out against the United States' decision to move ahead with tariffs on steel and aluminum imports. France, Germany, Canada and the European Union have said that the tariffs would be detrimental to the economy, reviving fears of a trade war and provoking retaliatory action from impacted countries. The U.S. action, which takes effect on Friday, casts a long shadow over a meeting of finance ministers from seven top economies, which sought to convince the United States of the consequences of the tariffs. Demonstrators in Kenya in response to government corruption charges. Let's hear about that and other stories making headlines around the world. Kenyan activists protested against corruption in Nairobi. This comes after Kenya's president vowed that some $80 million stolen from the National Youth Agency would be recovered. 24 of the 54 suspects charged with numerous cases of fraud pleaded guilty in court. The small fish, you know, when you do something small, you end up paying dearly. But these people who are looting billions and billions of shillings from our public coffers, they walk scot-free, and that is something that is so very much worried. We want this trend to change. In South Africa, hospital workers barricaded and protested at Charlotte, Mexico, Hospital in Johannesburg over the failure of the hospital to pay performance bonuses in overtime. A representative of an allied workers union said that they took action because of a lack of government response to a rally in March. Workers say it's been two years without bonus payments. Workers will meet with hospital management and government health officials on Friday. The United Nations Refugee Agency announced that it has reached a framework agreement with the Myanmar government aimed at allowing hundreds of thousands of Rohingya Muslims sheltering in Bangladesh to return safely and by choice. The UN High Commissioner for Refugees said that conditions are not yet conducive to enact the policy, but that the agreement is a first step towards voluntary return for the 700,000 Rohingya Muslims who have fled extreme violence and crackdown in Myanmar since August 2017. Arkady Babchenko, the Russian journalist who faked his own death in Ukraine, arrived at ATR TV channel on Thursday to greet his colleagues. Journalists embraced Babchenko after believing he had been gunned down in his apartment two days ago. Babchenko apologized to his colleagues, saying that he could not warn them ahead of time because he could not leak information. We've come to the end of this news brief, but for these and many other stories, you can find them on our website at talisertv.net forward slash English. We also have additional details on our social media, our Facebook, our Twitter, and our Instagram. For Tell Us Your English, I'm Sunny Gray. Thank you so much for watching.